Sushmita and apologies for the delay already and welcome all for the trek session titled as MEMTs, UAVs, SWARMs and MRCA, securing of security of autonomous and intelligent and born objects and platform. For this trek session, I'm pleased and uh, cordially inviting our guest, Air Marshal Daljeet Singh, sir, PVSM, AVSM, VM, former director, EW Operations, and he has donated many important appointments, such as Assistant Chief of Air Staff, Air Defense, Director General, Air Operations, Air Officer, Commanding in Chief of an Operational Command. Welcome, sir. Our another speaker, Air Marshal Rajesh Kumar, sir, PVSM, AVSM, VM, ADC, former Commander in Chief, Strategic Forces Command. Our speaker, Air Marshal G.S. Bedi, sir. AVSM, VM, VSM, former Director General, Inspection and Safety. Our guest, Air Commodore Mukund Kane, sir. Former Station Commander, Director, Mobile Communication and Networking and Principal Director, Communication. And our final panelist, Air Marshal Ashutosh Dikshit, sir. AVSM, VM, VSM. Uh, and he has donated many important uh, appointments such as Assistant Chief of Air Staff's Plan, Assistant Chief of Air Staff Projects. Prior to donating these uh, positions, currently he is working prestigiously as Deputy Chief of Air Staff. Also, I would like to inform that one of our panel speaker, Air Marshal Suraj Singh, sir, who is currently not available, uh, he has certain appointments with the chief. So I really welcome all our esteemed panelists to welcome on the stage. Please, sir. Thank you. Now I request, now I request our moderator, sir, Air Marshal Daljeet Singh, sir, to continue with the discussion. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we know we are already running behind time, so I will come straight to the point. Uh, while I'm uh, addressing this uh, August gathering, who are very, very expert and experienced in cyber security, so you are all are aware of the disruptive uh, development in the field of uh, technology, especially the computer, powers, communication sensors, and digital technology. Artificial intelligence, the foundation research on which commenced in 1956, uh, gained uh, traction during the last decade. Uh, due to these technological development which have brought in automation and autonomy in the conduct of operations and activities. For example, today we see development of self-driven cars and features of anti-collision, uh, smart cruise control, lane driving, driver attention level and default feature of almost all cars. Imagine the consequences if someone penetrates the car software and takes over the control of the car for destructive purposes. This is a simplistic example of the need for consideration of security of autonomous systems, both civilians and especially those employed in the armed forces. There have been cases in the past where the US UAVs on a surveillance mission where their data had been stolen and they were spoofed, taken control of, and made to land in other country. This was mainly because the data link of the UAV was not encrypted, and the AI was not programmed to geofence the UAV or avoid uh, signal anomaly detection. Now, of course, this happened a decade back. The AD network of Iranian Revolutionary Guards was cyber attacked in June 2019 by the US forces in retaliation to shooting down of their UAVs. And there are many such instances of directed cyber attacks against military uh, systems and UAVs. And this is going to increase. Therefore, the topic of today's discussion is very important and the security measures could be best implemented by cooperation amongst the industry 
amongst the users against the academia. And therefore, it is important. And it is nice to see that we have a mix of everybody uh, here to address this uh, situation. The armed forces all over the world have imbibed technology in a big way, which has led to networked operations where the sensors, shooters, and decision makers are all networked. AI tools provide filtered and actionable data to the decision maker to execute operations. This cycle, called the OODA loop, that is the observe, orient, decide, and act, can happen in near real time today. The advantage would be to ensure that the forces act faster than the adversary to retain initiative. A lot of uh, development has taken place towards uh, induction of artificial intelligence uh, in the armed forces. To give you an example, the MQ-25 Stingray UAV developed by Boeing can take off from the aircraft carrier in the sea carrying extra fuel conduct aerial uh, refueling of the fighters, and perform surveillance and electronic warfare uh, surveillance en route, and land back on the carrier in the sea, all autonomously. Manned F-35 and uncrewed F-16 fighters have been experimenting with the manned unmanned teaming operations where autonomous F-16 could undertake defensive action against an aerial threat while successfully engaging the ground target. Many of these programs are pointers to the future level of AI applications and autonomy that will be employed in future. Now coming back to the security of the airborne platforms, it is important that all aspects of security are considered. That is protection against physical attack of missiles and uh, hostile platforms. In fact, till today, the armed forces have been concentrating on this aspect of threat. But now, there are threats from directed energy weapons, like uh, lasers, high power uh, microwaves, and of course, the attacks through cyber and uh, electromagnetic uh, spectrum operations. So today we will concentrate on this aspect of uh, cyber uh, attacks. And if you all have any questions on other uh, aspects of security, please feel free to ask uh, at the end of the session. To give you a glimpse of the operational environment today, the engagement kill zones have expanded to many times as the air defense sensors are networked and surface-to-air missiles have ranges in excess of 500 kilometers. The attacking force, therefore, have to stand off, and they have an arsenal of long-range standoff precision weapons like cruise missiles covering more than 1,000 kilometer range with precision strike capability of less than a meter. Modern combat aircraft can attack more than 10 targets simultaneously while retaining the capability to engage the aerial threat, which could be 100 kilometers away. Hypersonic missiles have already been employed during uh, the recent uh, Russian-Ukraine war. And to counter such a threat, which is traveling at 3 kilometers per second, automation and autonomy in detecting, tracking, and engagement would definitely be required. Now, therefore, coupling uh, human intelligence with the artificial intelligence would ensure a better lethality and much lesser risk for the military personnel. So today we have uh, the panel that will discuss this concept and capabilities of UAVs, manned, unmanned teaming, uh, multi-role combat aircraft, to give you an overview of uh, the operational environment and how they are networked and where there could be vulnerabilities and what needs to be tackled. How do we club these vulnerabilities? This is the uh, main uh, discussion which we will we'll have. And uh, I am uh, glad to introduce you to a very experienced and expert panel. 
As already covered, Air Marshal Dixit is the Deputy Chief of Air Staff, Indian Air Force. Air Marshal Rajesh Kumar, Kargil War Veteran, and involvement in development of the LCA project. Air Marshal G.S. Bedi, another Kargil War Veteran, experienced in uh, military operations. And Air Commander Kane, an experienced technologist, involved in many projects in the Indian Air Force, and in establishing the network in the Air Force. So now I request Air Marshal G.S. Bedi to give you an overview of uh, what these UAVs and uh, multi uh, manning, unmanning teams and swarms are concerned. G.S. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, UAVs, uh, you know, I don't want to, I mean, I don't have to educate this audience what UAV is, except to say uh, that they have been made popular by recent conflicts and they are available for different roles, come in different sizes and shapes. From an insect-sized drone to Reaper or Global Hawk with a wingspan of half the football-sized field, uh, they are, uh, you know, prevalent. Now, why have they become uh, important or popular? You know, the two aspects that UAVs offer is depth of magazine and unfavorable exchange ratio for the adversary. Depth of magazine, that is their low cost. And there is no limit to how many of you can uh, employ. If you Google up that how many UAVs have been lost in Russia-Ukraine war, they'll go into thousands. And unfavorable exchange ratio is that you employ a $10,000 to $20,000 worth UAV, and if you need a million dollar missile to counter it, that's a very, very unfavorable exchange ratio for the adversary. But should you not do it? Because if that UAV is going to now destroy your multi-million dollar asset, then you have no choice. So the employment of UAV kind of, you know, looks very, very uh, uh, lucrative. Now the kind of roles that they can undertake is uh, ISR, that is your intelligence surveillance reconnaissance. They can guide formations of aircraft. They can do target designation uh, for the striking aircraft. And of course, there are kamikaze attacks uh, drone. Now, Shahed has become a household name uh, in, you know, because of uh, Russian uh, use. Now, what has happened is the absence of human being in a drone makes them look like expendable. You know, general feeling is that just because there is no human being lost, uh, you can afford to lose them. And that's what most of the literature uh, says. But what happens is even if cost is not the issue, which it actually is in certain cases, uh, it is their role which is important. Means why do we need to uh, secure them? Now, ISR function or intelligence function aids in UDA loop, like uh, A. Marshal Daljeet Singh said, in your decision-making loop. Now, if the success of my multi-aircraft mission, there are 40, 50 aircraft which are dependent on this uh, intelligence input, which is going to be provided by this crucial UAV, or I have a UAV which is going to uh, designate the target for this uh, uh, multi-aircraft mission, then can I afford to lose that UAV? Because if I lose that UAV, now my complete mission of 40, 50 aircraft is actually rendered uh, useless. So it is very important that we secure uh, these assets, not because of uh, themselves, because uh, what they are uh, planning to uh, give us in return. Now, Reapers or Global Hawks, you know, they are, they, uh, they operate at a very low level of automation. There is always someone controlling them. Autonomy may increase slowly, but so will the uh, vulnerability. Now, what happens is they have been operating, they are okay in a Iraq or Afghanistan kind of scenario, but their, you know, survivability in contested airspace needs to be seen. An incident over Black Sea is uh, there for everyone to uh, see. Now, uh, what I come to is that this use of cheap drones, you know, crashing into targets or dropping grenades over tanks can create a lot of trouble for the adversary, but probably cannot win a war uh, by itself, uh, you know, for you. So they need to be employed on what we are discussing, vulnerability of the UAVs, of those kind of UAVs, uh, which can be employed in a greater role to uh, reap much greater benefits or which can enhance the a general combat potential of your other assets. Now, MUMTI, what we call uh, man unmanned teaming, is probably uh, one such role. And uh, what does it do? It's a, it's a concept of, you know, that increased number of affordable platforms complementing expensive fifth-gen uh, aircraft. But now what happens is there is a little problem here. 
that while this concept is very popular, or now we talk about it, and uh, you know, uh, terminology like loyal wingman, okay, or even if you uh, Google the images of Bumpty, it will show you one fighter aircraft and a whole lot of UAVs gathered around it. Now the problem is that just about any UAV cannot accompany a uh, fighter aircraft, you know, so anybody cannot become a loyal uh, wingman. The speed and maneuverability of a fighter aircraft will have to be matched for this, uh, by this loyal wing band. So if you talk of general UAVs, which can fly at most 300 to 350 kilometers an hour, or you know, cannot maneuver the way uh, a Su-30 or a LCA can maneuver, then probably it cannot really qualify uh, to be called into uh, a MUMTI. Now USA, uh, it's a have Raider 2 program, again, uh, like a Marshall introduced, have F-35 and F-22, uh, it employs an F-16 autonomous uh, plane, you know, which can uh, keep uh, pace with it. Uh, their Valkyr program, which they had started, had X-58, stealthy, very high-speed uh, unmanned aircraft, which uh, proved this uh, uh, concept. And China, of course, is using J-20 with Wing Lung CH-10, that is, it's about 700 kilometers an hour it can uh, go. Our own HAL, you know, has got CATS program, combat uh, air uh, teaming system. Okay, now it plans probably to use Ghatak. Ghatak UAV is going to be powered by, uh, recently we heard that flying wing uh, news, okay, it will be powered by Kaveri dry engine, 52 kilonewtons of thrust and probably is supposed to be going uh, supersonic also. So now that is going to be teamed with LCA or Su-30 or any uh, other aircraft. Now, uh, and of course they've demonstrated Dhruv-based, uh, you know, MUMTI uh, concept where small UAVs can also be uh, sort of shown. But again, their survivability in contested airspace will uh, uh, remain an issue. Now, what can work instantly, if, if these things are Gathak is some time away, what can work instantly is your surface manned asset versus unmanned teaming. That means, uh, I have a surface radar or I have a surface missile which has got 500 kilometers of range but it is limited by radar horizon. Now it cannot pick up this 500 kilometer range is of no use if it cannot detect the target beyond 70, 80 kilometers which is coming at 100 meters, for example. So now this UAV probably can provide me over the horizon capability. You know, it, if it uh, extends my radar horizon and makes me look at those aircraft which are, you know, beyond this radar, then that is a kind of teaming which can uh, immediately work. In the air, what can work is probably unmanned, unmanned uh, teaming. Uh, you know, a similar kind of UAV is getting together, which in another, uh, you know, name we can call Swarm. Now, Swarm is, you know, smart warfighting array of reconfigured uh, modules. It is then abbreviation uh, for Swarm. Okay, now they, uh, what do they do? Minimum of three and up to thousands of UAVs, when they get together, they qualify to be called a uh, swarm. What you hear about Russian kamikaze attacks, you know that uh, hundreds of UAVs going and attacking Shahids are not swarms, they're mass attack. You know, there is a typical uh, requirement or, uh, you know, characteristics of swarm where each drone is talking to each other, is operating in coordination with the other drone and at the same time is capable of uh, operating uh, on its own. Uh, U.S. Navy, for example, has a locust program, you know, again, they are very good at abbrevi uh, abbreviations. Locust, I mean, such an op uh, apt name, stands for low-cost unmanned aerial vehicle swarming technology. Now, there are fixed-wing swarms, there are quadcopter, uh, you know, storms. They employ two important elements, that is AI and uh, ML. They can, what can they do? You know, they can, uh, they have shared ISR, they can have distributed ISR. Now, they are difficult to shoot down one by one. The advantage they provide is if there are 50, 60 of them also, you cannot take out one by one, one by one. But the most important aspect which they provide is redundancy. What I just talked about, that if my subsequent uh, mission is going to depend on, uh, you know, these uh, drones capability, then I cannot afford to lose, have, you know, losing going the drone out of the uh, way uh, altogether. There will be different levels of automation. Centralized means where someone is controlling them. Decentralized, which is to some extent one guy controlling many and uh, fully autonomous. And uh, you know, uh, whether it is MUMTI or swarms or whatever it is, they need data links. What uh, Air Marshal again said, that you know, that will become the most uh, uh, vulnerable part, securing them physically as well as electronically. 
set i mean you you can probably jam the direct link but if you say that you will uh, operate through satellites or something that is uh, that's going to remain limited because of bandwidth or even latency uh, issues will uh, uh, remain and direct link or gps dependence is always vulnerable there was a demonstration done by chinese about 1500 swarm drones uh, launched 490 of them came back because of disruption in uh, gps so what you see in the new year display or you know various uh, uh, showmanship swarm is actually not going to be like that in contested airspace it will be very different uh, ball game and lastly uh, you know uh, securing them i would say i mean the details will be covered by other uh, experts but it is that more than in my opinion the data security that is more than hacking it is our discipline poor discipline uh, which is the uh, you know uh, problem i mean a 128 uh, aes standard bit uh, encryption they say is so powerful factorial of 128 that if you put you know all the supercomputers of the world together will take probably a billion years to hack that password but the problem is that how do you uh, protect that data uh, or something like that if i am last statement sir if i am told a password let's say by somebody that you know this is password you have to remember you can put any amount of electrodes on me probably you cannot get password out but if i am compromised over a drink then probably you'll have the password uh, readily uh, available thank you very much uh, thank you uh, ds uh, to uh, he gave you an uh, overview of uh, employment of uh, uh, mandatement uh, uh, uavs as well as uh, swarm See, the manned and unmanned UAVs also, it all depends upon the operational environment. The advantage of uh, this manned and unmanned uh, UAVs is that you can have reconfigurable uh, unmanned uh, wingman with you as a loyal man. Today, I may require it for um, uh, destruction of air defense systems. Tomorrow, I may require it for air-to-air -air engagements. And thereafter, I may have to require it for something else. So it is reconfigurable and the amount of autonomy you want to give it to this system uh, depends upon you. The most important part is, now suppose you have a breakdown of the networking between the unmanned and the manned. Will that system be able to operate autonomously? That is where the maturity is being looked into. Because it should be able to operate autonomously it should be able to uh, recognize who is a friend and who is foe and where it has to get back. And it could be expendable or it could be, uh, it has to be retrieved. But the world is moving ahead in this direction in a, in a very uh, fast manner. In uh, Royal Air Force, they have planned to replace a squadron of uh, eight typhoons with two typhoons, ten mosquito uh, unmanned UAVs, and 100 uh, swarm, uh, albino swarm. They are working on it. They have made some success. And that is the concept they are really looking at. Now, uh, we all know uh, today the Indian Air Force has uh, excellent aeroplanes, 4 to 4.5 gen, and so do we have adversaries. Now, they are also exploited very well, and they are also networked. Now, to give you an overview of uh, what these uh, multi-role combat aircraft, different gen, what they can do, so I'll request uh, Air Marshal Dixit, uh, who is handling uh, all these projects and is well aware of uh, the capabilities, uh, in about five, six minutes to tell us uh, about their operational aspects. Thank you, sir. Before I start uh, telling about uh, aircraft part, let me just define the uh, magnitude of the problem. Okay, uh, when I joined Indian Air Force uh, and I was working much below them, uh, to get a call from one place to another place used to take 48, 48 hours minimum. Today, uh, we have gone so ahead that Indian Air Force is owning a uh, intranet, pan-India, complete network with our own cloud. And also we are creating a network in the air, airborne network we are creating. So, uh, and this is also come into our uh, operational philosophy. We have, uh, uh, what, is the, what are these networks? You can define them into the 
area of use. So we have uh, information grid, we have sensing grid, we have effects grid, and we have command grid. So this is the functional uh, description of uh, these networks. The effects grid is what has these aircraft, uh, missiles, uh, uh, the kinetic mills are part of this effects grid. Now, to look at the physical layout of the network. So, uh, we have uh, on ground, uh, we have cables and routers and all those uh, systems are there. Uh, there is uh, software running on that. In the, in the air, uh, we have uh, all these aircraft uh, flying, talking to each other over uh, superior, very fast uh, data links. What does this bring on the table? Now, since uh, time immemorial, immemorial, the warfare has been always said that it is there is something called fog of war. Okay? You don't know uh, what is the real situation on ground. These networks and uh, the data fusion which they provide, uh, we want this fog of war to become less, less, less and we also want it to disappear. It may not happen, but maybe after some time it can happen. So, we are trying to generate a unified picture of all the elements which are there available. This, for this we are using software design, radio, radios, various waveforms, tremendous amount of compute power is available uh, on board aircraft. Now, when we talk of uh, multi-role combat aircraft, what we are looking at, we are looking at so till now, uh, till now, we were looking at on-platform sensor fusion. So platform has got say EW sensors, uh, IR sensors, radar sensors and lot of weapons. So this fusion is happening on board. Now we are looking at network sensor fusion. So uh, these platforms are carrying these sensors and there are multiple such platforms in a network. So, a common network picture must emerge. Now, how th this is happening today uh, is uh, slightly technical. Uh, if you ask me later, I can explain it to you. But the result is that everybody, all war fighters, all my uh, weapon launch platforms, all my decision makers are getting uniform picture. Okay. So, this is only for the air part of it. We have to now introduce the land component and the maritime component and maybe after some time the space component. So this is the path we are working on. Imagine the attack surface available for to the adversary or like sir said to your own compromised person. Imagine the attack surface available to him is so huge, he can create disruption, he can create uh, means uh, uh, spoofing. So anything like this can be done. We have to at the design stage, at implementation stage, training stage, maintenance, everywhere we have to be extra careful. And that is where we are uh, looking at industry and we are actually taking big help uh, of them in the security portion of that. We have data link encryptions, uh, uh, we are trying to uh, do uh, sandboxing of the most important uh, uh, algorithms. So all these kind of things we are doing. We are also trying to do resilient uh, algorithms or uh, trying to run them at multiple places and use at uh, only one place. So these kind of things we are doing. <coughs> now we come to one more aspect which is going to be as part of the future uh, generation aircraft. That is on the same platform man-machine teaming. So some decisions which I am taking, he will give me maybe a menu or the most preferred option. This machine will have to give me and I will, so this will uh, reduce my uh, cognition uh, requirement in the cockpit. So today you have seen like in Su-30 or in some of these aircraft, there are two pilots. 
I will not have, uh, I will have only single pilot or maybe four aircraft and only one pilot. Like this, we are uh, going in this uh, direction. It will be massively dependent on artificial intelligence. To art for this artificial intelligence to work, the amount of data required is at least a magnitude higher from the data which we are handling today. Why I am telling you this? Again, I am trying to explain the vulnerability in cyber security which it will bring along with that. Apart from whatever the vulnerability is happening during training stage of training of AI systems and those kind of things. So, uh, very good opportunities are available in times to come. That is what uh, I am saying. Now, if you break down each system, okay, each system if you break down, you will find that uh, at each component level, at each software level, at each firmware level, there is a scope to introduce cyber security uh, aspects. Okay, so that is my message. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dixit, for giving uh, an architecture of uh, net-centric uh, uh, operations and uh, the requirement of this networking, which is very, very important. Many years back, uh, US Air Force uh, had deployed F-22 aircraft, which was supposed to be stealth aircraft. But then, for it to retain stealth, it was not connected. It was not networked. Because, uh, remember, if you are networked also, uh, you can be detected. Now, when it remained uh, unnetworked, its uh, exploitation reduced tremendously in today's environment. And finally, they had to network that uh, aeroplane, but in a passive manner. So now you realize the importance and you realize how important it is to conceive all these things beforehand. Otherwise, you will not be able to exploit the potential of such an expensive aeroplane if you thought it would uh, remain standalone. Now, coming to uh, net centric operations and um, what stage are we as far as net centric adaptation of net centricity in the armed forces or especially in the Air Force is concerned? So, I invite uh, Air Commander Kane to talk about uh, what is the status of uh, net centric operations uh, in the Air Force. Thank you, sir. Uh I mean, from what all has been spoken till now, I'm sure the effect will not be possible if they are not networked. And uh, network happens to be the basis on which, you know, all these weapon platforms are able to integrate. So it's not that we are trying to steal the thunder, but then as a technologist who's been responsible for the network part of it, I'm very proud that we have been able to provide a platform to integrate all these beautiful weapons that we have. Now, this networking hasn't happened overnight. It has been a journey for us. Um, as it was mentioned by Sir earlier that, you know, getting a call used to take almost a couple of days to get a call through. But today, as it is with the outside world, uh, I mean, it's just on the fly that we happen to get it. And uh, the network happens to be in such a fashion that uh, the kind of data which is required to take a decision in order to reduce the fog of war Firstly, it, the database, it's the data on which, uh, you know, everybody going to work on. And there has to be unity of data. And that unity of data is being provided by the network which is available to us in Indian Air, Indian Air Force and the data centers along with the network where, you know, we are able to extend the unity of data so that the decision making becomes that much simpler. There is no separate stream of data or information which is flowing into a decision maker which will further confuse him to make a decision. The information which flows to him is unitary. It's singular information. And that has been the strength of our network. Network, I mean, we have to understand that in a warlike situation, in a hostile situation, this network is going to get degraded. But we have to ensure that the degradation is graceful in nature. And uh, for that, we need to have sufficient redundancies available into the network. Not only that, it is not that we are going to sit in our bases and going to conduct operations. Our, our systems, they are going to be deployed in the forward areas where the terrestrial network will not be able to reach that particular location. So we have to depend a lot on the non-terrestrial network also. So we have a satellite overlay 
which will provide as a backup to this network available. So wherever a terrestrial network is not able to reach our weapon system, the satellite will come into the picture and uh, help us, you know, integrate it backward into our, into our grid, our information grid. Not only that, uh, with theaterization having taken, I mean, we get to hear a lot about it in the newspaper and on the media regarding theaterization where uh, we'll have synergy of all the three forces. Now, in order to have a synergy of these three forces, I don't think it will be possible without having networking amongst the three services. So we have a program called uh, the Network for Services, uh, Network for Spectrum, where there will be a common network for all the three services with a common point of, a secure point of data interconnect. Because finally, when it comes to consumption of data, it's not that, you know, the data, uh, like whatever data that uh, as an Air Force uh, that I require to consume, that entire data needs to be provided to the uh, other sister services. So there's only a limited data because the authenticity and the sanctity of the data remains till such time the notion of privilege is applied to it. So that's the reason why, you know, in when we talk of networking, of data networking, uh, there will be secure points of interconnect where the required data which is required by the other two services or, you know, the data is required from the other two services to the Indian Air Force. So a secure point of interconnect has been made available through the NFS program wherein the data between the three services will be exchange, inter-exchanged. In addition to that, we have also gone in and we are kind of Air Force is the first one to be our own Airtel and Geos. So we have our own captive mobile network and that's a big plus point as far as operations go. And that's a feather in our networking cap, especially now with that upgrade for to 4G and 5G. Earlier we were a captive 3G network and now we have upgraded to 4G and 5G and in the very near future it's going to be rolled out. So the kind of, uh, you know, uh, the data capacity that the 5G network is going to afford us, it is going to be humongous. And not only that, the kind of data security that will, that will be there in a 5G network, I mean, that will be unthinkable in the present case. So this is the overlay of network that we have. Uh, I think I'll come back to the security aspect later on in the discussion, sir. Uh, thank you, Kane. So he's given you an overview of uh, where we are as far as networking is concerned and what kind of uh, networking there is and the need for commonality as far as networking is concerned. He talked about inter-service and also we need to look at if we buy a new system, new equipment, will it have protocols to network? That also has to be considered because these days there, there is, cannot be anything which is standalone. So these are the main takeaways. Uh, now that we have uh, undergone, gone through the operational environment and what kind of networking there is and uh, where we are, so it is important now to talk about the vulnerabilities uh, as far as cyber is concerned. So I request Air Marshal Rajesh to uh, give an insight on this. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, uh, when we look at the vulnerabilities uh, of uh, all these networks and, uh, uh, you know, if you look at the vulnerabilities of the UAVs and um, other such vehicles in contested airspace. So uh, the first uh, vulnerability, of course, uh, is kinetic. So if you look at the current uh, war that is going on between uh, uh, Israel, uh, sorry, Ukraine and Russia, uh, uh, there are claims from all sides, and uh, if you look at the claims from the uh, Russian side, they say that they have shot down almost 90% of the UAVs that came across. And uh, uh, Ukrainians say that they have shot down 80% of uh, all uh, uh, vehicles that have crossed on their side of the border. So uh, obviously, uh, the first, uh, uh, you know, option is uh, kinetic, but as uh, Amashad Bedi point out, pointed out, you can't keep shooting down uh, uh, $5,000 uh, drones with uh, million dollar missiles. And uh, therefore, there, there are more subtle means available to apply some of the vulnerabilities that uh, are uh, there. And uh, uh, we also had uh, uh, Amashad Daljit Singh tell us that uh, how some of these have been exploited since decades ago. 
So just to recap the, the incident of uh, uh, the uh, uh, Skygrabber uh, software in 2009, so the Iraqi insurgents, so this is now we are talking of, you know, a not very sophisticated uh, uh, opponents uh, using uh, commercially off-the-shelf uh, um, software to hijack the image stream from a very sophisticated uh, UAV. And, uh, uh, you know, in 2011, uh, Iran, uh, just through sheer GPS spoofing, and actually, to my mind, it wasn't even spoofing so much as it was jamming, a brute jamming, were able to uh, bring down an RQ-170 Sentinel um, multi-million dollar UAV. Uh, and of course, uh, they went even a step further, even though uh, it's not uh, acknowledged such, that they managed to uh, insert some uh, keylogger malware in uh, one of the ground stations. So now as you look at UAVs and uh, how they are operated and what they consist of in this uh, domain, you find that a typical UAV will uh, have some kind of a sensor, a navigation system, wireless uh, satellite and communication link, some embedded computers and controllers, onboard sensors and autopilot, and uh, if it is armed, some uh, combat and weapon systems, and of course, there is an actuation and powertrain uh, for its uh, systems. And these are all linked by an internal communication bus. So this is from here, uh, we see what the vulnerabilities can be for any uh, unmanned vehicle. And then not to forget that it's not just the unmanned vehicle uh, which can be targeted. It can be the ground station which is controlling it. Uh, it can also be uh, uh, streaming data or get connected to field users who are uh, actually, um, uh, you know, using this data and therefore uh, are connected by a network to uh, this UAV. And uh, uh, a typical ground station will have uh, wireless and uh, satellite links and uh, will also have uh, uh, some ground station uh, cyber infrastructure and uh, operate operators. And uh, like uh, we said, when we start uh, looking at all these uh, aspects, you find that wherever the network is, it can be, uh, uh, you know, uh, compromised through various types of attacks, uh, such as uh, distributed uh, uh, DOS attacks and, uh, uh, you know, GPS jamming, interception, spoofing, uh, information theft, alteration, and not to forget, when we talk of any operator in the loop or any field user in the loop, they can be compromised to get uh, information that is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, that will uh, compromise the integrity of uh, the UAV. So, um, the cyber uh, threats that are uh, uh, for these UAVs can be used in flight or they can be their base can be targeted and uh, uh, you can exploit vulnerabilities in software, security uh, uh, and policies and uh, communication technologies. And what basically is the aim of any uh, cyber attack? It will be to um, look at the confidentiality, integrity and availability of data. And uh, uh, any attack tree would then target some of these uh, um, aspects of uh, confidentiality, integrity and availability and uh, uh, try to get uh, either information out in a passive form or to disrupt the operations of that particular UAV. So um, uh, there are um, various vul other vulnerabilities, um, these uh, May uh, this is you know uh, um, back doors to gain unauthorized access, and uh, thereafter manipulate the flight path to take control of the vehicle, and uh, uh, malicious software can also uh, infect the systems on board uh, autonomous vehicles and interfere with the algorithms, uh, so uh, causing them to crash or uh, uh, things like that, or collect various types of data, including images, videos, 
location information and uh, ensuring that encryption and secure transmission of this data uh, is uh, interrupted. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, jamming and spoofing as far as the navigation systems are concerned, uh, we do realize that uh, all these systems are very vulnerable to this aspect because uh, anybody who's using GPS is got a very highly sensitive receiver because of the low levels of uh, 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 signals that come from the satellites and therefore they can be easily, I mean you cannot have infinite dynamic range and therefore there is always possibilities of uh, uh, these things being uh, 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 jammed and spoofed. So um, the key thing that uh, one takes away from these vulnerabilities is that many of these UAVs were designed either from commercial off-the-shelf equipment um, and uh, even when they were designed for military uses, uh, there was no real effort because uh, of the mindset of being expendable. Uh, there was no real effort in uh, hardening them against uh, um, uh, cyber threats and basically they were being designed without adequate security features from the get-go. So therefore, they have a lot of these inherent vulnerabilities which are available for exploitation. And uh, 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 if you interfere with some of the UAVs which are very critical for the mission, like uh, Marshal Bedi pointed out, then you can interfere with the OODA loop of the uh, uh, operator and gain an advantage uh, which could be critical uh, during war time. So I'll stop there and uh, uh, hand you over. Uh, thank you, Rajesh. Uh, uh, he's covered all aspects. Uh, and uh, the important aspect he's brought out is there is a requirement to consider this uh, security, cyber security, right at the acquisition stage. In fact, now we are talking of uh, open architecture system, we are talking of uh, court system. Now they inherently are vulnerable. While uh, we look at this to ensure standardization connectivity, but it is also important to uh, have this cyber security considered uh, right at, at that itself. So therefore it is important to put this as one of the, uh, what you call, um, necessary requirements, essential requirements, to say that the system has to be cyber secure. If you mention that, it requires much more effort, much more money to make them more uh, cyber resistant, cyber attack resistant. And when we talk of uh, procurement, it is always L1. Now somebody will make effort only in case it is specified in the OAS to state that it has to be cyber hardened. And then we will be at a, a much uh, better uh, option. And I'll give you another example. Defense Acquisition Procedure 2020 has, uh, regarding the cyber uh, security, it states that uh, the vendor has to give a certificate. It's called malicious certificate, which states that hardware and software being offered does not contain malicious code that would activate to damage or disable the functioning of the equipment. Today, is this certificate sufficient? We have now uh, indigenous capability to really check it out, to audit it. Now, there would be issue of uh, source code and other such things. But it is important now to put our foot down to say that we want to make sure that we do not get into this kind of the situations. So these are the areas which uh, we will probably have to look into uh, more seriously. Now, uh, the next part will be left is, what are the ways and means to secure these uh, uh, gaps, vulnerabilities? So uh, initially, I'll request uh, uh, Air Commodore Kane to give us a small uh, uh, brief on this. Uh, as uh, has been brought out, that uh, vulnerability will exist and it will be exploited. And the most frightening vulnerability that one can think of in the cyber domain is the zero-day vulnerabilities, because that is something which none of us knows. And uh, I'll take you back to the initial Stux Stuxnet uh, worm, which was spread by the Americans and Israelis together. I mean, that was the first instance where, you know, they had actually weaponized technology 
in terms of uh, destroying the centrifuge of the Iranian uh, Natanz uh, nuclear uh, facility there. And they had exploited four zero-day vulnerabilities. So it took them almost five years to, you know, work on that. Of course, there would have been some back-end collusion with uh, the Siemens, I mean, the centrifuge th that belonged to Siemens and uh, the Microsoft Windows, the ubiquitous uh, Windows. So this is something that we will actually be very, very afraid of uh, when we are conducting our operations. When we talked about these manned and unmanned systems which are airborne, a very important factor for these systems to function properly is the navigation, the precision navigation which is required, navigation information which is required for these systems to perform to their optimum level. And um, this information they get through the GPS system. Right now, majorly, we end up using the American GPS. But uh, of course, with uh, India's Navic coming up, I think uh, enough stress and uh, government is you know, giving us uh, directions that Navic is the GPS that is required to be used. And that is one kind of major uh, you know, advantage that we could have our, our, uh, over our adversary in terms of having our own uh, global positioning system. So Navic is something that we need to aim for and we need to operationalize it at the earliest. Secondly, uh, when we talk about these airborne systems where they have to exchange, uh, you know, control information amongst each other, where there's a swarm or, you know, multiple systems which are operating in the air. So these control systems, when they're exchanged between the two platforms, I mean, they can be hijacked, they can be spoofed. So one good way of avoiding that is use of digital certificates though it is going to put an uh, overhead onto the uh, you know computation of uh, you know the time taken for it to comprehend the control system given but then this digital certificate is one way where we can obviate the cyber threat of hijacking or uh, you know spoofing of our control signals and that is another important factor that needs to be taken uh, into account thirdly when these aircrafts in are in air while they may, you know, while they're in LOS range, they may talk to themselves, you know, in the LOS range, but they're, when they're beyond LOS range, they have to communicate through satellites. Now, satellite turns out to be an Achilles heel as far as jamming is considered. So uh, now how do we overcome that? So now today we have a technology which has come to our rescue and uh, we need to, you know, deploy our LEO satellites because that will be, they will be much more difficult to jam vis-a-vis -a, -vis a geosynchronous or a geostationary satellite. So LEO satellite is another technology where we have to invest in heavily and we are already onto that path of, you know, developing our own uh, uh, LEO system. So wherein it will also, over, it will overcome the advantage the latency disadvantage and the data bandwidth disadvantage that a normal uh, you know geostationary or geosynchronous satellite has thirdly the cyber threat unlike these hardware platforms uh, it doesn't require a very expansive defense industrial base as uh, i mean we see in this ais seminar itself today so there are so many firms, you know, we are developing so many software applications, software modules and uh, cyber applications that these kind of applications will be driven by a small vendor base. And that is where, you know, we have to be uh, slightly careful when we employ them because the development of these weapon systems uh, there will be a kind of an advanced APTs which will be there, advanced persistent threats, because uh, these contractors, they are going to be, you know, the cyber systems are going to be system of systems, and mostly they are going to be a COTS, COTS item. I mean, it will be until unless it's a new niche uh, SCADA system that we are talking about, but the major, I mean, quite a few modules are going to be COTS in nature, and that's where the threat lies. Because that's where something, a zero-day vulnerability can definitely be introduced and it will be very difficult for us to stop that zero-day vulnerability. So there are certain rules and regulations which will have to be in place. And the decision makers, the decision makers will also have to be alive to this changing situation. And the compliances that the contractors need to be, you know, compli compliance, will play compliance too. For this, uh, the, the, there is a way, you know, where we can have a sandboxing environment wherein, you know, these uh, systems or these uh, software modules or applications which have been provided by these uh, COTS vendors, where they can be tested, they can be tested in a sandbox module. 
And for that, we can have a security testing lab, which we are already on our way of developing a security testing lab, where all these modules, before they get deployed onto a system, actual system, they are tested extensively in these labs, I mean, to detect any kind of, uh, you know, zero-day vulnerability that they could have. So that requires a lot of, you know, a very good HR as well. So HR becomes a very, very important element, notwithstanding the AI that everybody has been talking about. In spite of AI, it's finally the man behind the machine and the man who's going to develop these systems. He's going to be a very, very, uh, one of the most important cog in the entire wheel. Lastly is the cyber hygiene. I mean, in my entire career in the Indian Air Force, Wherever, you know, any incursion has taken place or, uh, you know, wherever any bug or malware has gone into a system, a human has been involved in it, invariably. It has never been, you know, only technology which has been able to ingress into our air gap network. It has always been a human in the loop. galti se, you know, ye laga di flash drive laga diya. So it's always the human, because finally, you know, the cyber warfare to take place, there has to be an element or a carrier inside your network, which will en enable cyber warfare to take place. And this element will be carried by the human in the loop. So cyber hygiene is something which we have to, which we have to develop. So in order to have a cyber hygiene, it's a cyber culture that needs to be developed in our environment. Without the development of a cyber culture, uh, I mean, we are not going anywhere. So that's why persistent training. So uh, advanced persistent threat ki jage pe, advanced persistent training is something that we require for our entire community, especially in the defense forces. And uh, finally, you know, in our services, we say that um, security is everybody's concern. So rather, uh, at the end, I would say that we need to prefix security with cyber security. So cyber security is everybody's concern, not only the operator or the service provider or the cyber air warrior, but there are so many other elements in the forces. They are also equally responsible for the cyber security that we are talking about. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Rajesh, for giving us uh, the insight into uh, what uh, it requires to be cyber secure. So uh, what it comes down to is um, in future, more of cyberspace would be utilized and exploited to the maximum. Now, once that happens, there would be vulnerabilities and uh, which will uh, have to be addressed. And uh, as I said, uh, it is important that right from uh, planning stage, acquisition stage, one has to factor in uh, all these aspects. Second aspect is uh, trust on autonomy. Uh, trust on um, artificial intelligence. Now suppose uh, today uh, we, uh, as veterans, suppose we are sitting in an ops room and we see a screen and you find that there is a lot of uh, chaos going on, probably we'll tell them to switch off the screen and take charge. Whereas if there is a young uh, person who is, uh, officer who has gone through everything else and he sees there is so much of chaos, he will tell computer to take charge and run away. So the, there are two kinds of uh, mindsets. It will take time for uh, people to start uh, trusting uh, the artificial intelligence and uh, uh, take charge. But it has yet to mature. So it is not uh, at the moment at that stage. So for the armed forces, it is going to be scalable uh, adaptation of artificial intelligence usefully. And thereafter, we'll go on to uh, automation and uh, autonomy. So uh, with this, we uh, have spoken. I can take uh, two questions, and uh, thereafter we will uh, conclude. Please say your name and whom you would like to address. Sir, this is uh, Vinay Kumar here. And I'd like to put this question to the open forum. Uh, with the use of technology and you know Air Force bringing in a lot of vendors for a lot of things which are usually done, one of the aspects that I like to highlight is the documentation attack. There's a whole lot of leakage of information in the RFPs itself. So whenever you're asking for a vendor to work on anything, the height, weight, temperatures, sensor details, frequency details, and a whole lot of other information which is part of your organizational thinking is leaked out in the RFP itself. I would like you to you know, put some 
insights into this and if possible take care of it especially in the age of generative ai for example if i want to do a search on the swarm attacks just doing a generative ai on the past trend records i can come up with a whole lot of requirements of the aif which could be used of very critical information thank you okay uh, thank you for your question uh, see it is like this uh, before the rfp the rfi starts and uh, then you give take the broad guidelines and thereafter you work on uh, rfp uh, this aspect is uh, well considered and uh, whatever uh, the armed forces or the headquarter they feel that this uh, requirement to give it in public is inescapable they will restrict to that only and not really go beyond that and uh, thereafter once they scrutinize uh, the inputs then they decide further and before that you have to sign nda agreement and all other aspects so these uh, security aspects are uh, well considered uh, with the aim to get the best also uh, dikshit would you like to emphasize slightly more on this is it okay uh, there are various levels of uh, tendering which we do so where it is uh, actually uh, sensitive uh, thing we only do limited tendering we it is it does not go into public domain very few items which go into open domain uh, we are we are living in open society actually we are democracy open society uh, i have to follow rule of law uh, the land uh, law of the land the it is uh, becoming uh, not very important about the capability of the platform it is the employment philosophy of the platform i have a knife how do i use it is more important rather than how sharp or how long the knife is that is in short is what i am trying to now defend uh, cuz information may be leaking even after the system has come into it. but only the uh, capability of the system per se uh, see uh, like all american systems uh, that apache uh, helicopter you google it you will find the pilot operating manual on internet okay go to any torrent site you can download it so in this world today uh, what is there inside your mind is more important to save uh, rather than but uh, at that we fully take a point we try to do whatever uh, best we can do uh thank you uh, last question hi sir uh, thank you for such an knowledgeable session on the capabilities of armed forces and the networking capabilities that we have i just had one small question where you had mentioned that uh, for hard to reach terrains uh, the the air force or the armed forces are not just relying on conventional networks but they uh, they are also utilizing satellite communications where the conventional networks are hard to reach in those terrains or those war zones i was uh, so we know that nowadays nations are developing capabilities in space warfare also where they are targeting satellites uh, also so i just want to understand if there is any thinking around also going a step further to maybe use delay tolerant networks or uh, maybe opportunistic networks to kind of uh, still have some networking capability in case even the satellites are targeted by the adversaries okay uh, thank you uh, requestion the first thing is uh, even the set uh, satellite communication is being hardened because that is one of the areas and there are other uh, ways and means uh, which uh, are employed to ensure that there is uh, something which is left for for the final uh, connectivity uh, so i will just leave it at that okay I'll, uh, you can take on the last question and Uh, in your systems so flying ad hoc networks would be uh, related to swarms are they also being incorporated in the systems those are two questions kane uh, first first regarding quantum so 
quantum uh, if you are asking whether air force is in isolation or uh, on its own uh, is doing something in the quantum space uh, the answer would be no because that's a national mission uh, announced by the government of india and we are part and on board that national mi mission for development of quantum technologies now there's one is development of quantum technologies and the other is that will take some time and uh, probably so much of resources. So there's another thing called PQC, that is post-quantum cryptography. So in that, yes, definitely Air Force is, has also got a finger in it, that pie. And um, we are working on PQC along with, uh, you know, the government agencies. Uh, until such time, the quantum actually comes through. Uh, you can be rest assured uh, that... Uh, as on date with the technology, quantum technology, which is in vogue and available, our encryption is quantum safe. Okay? So that uh, goes as far as your quantum technology goes. Because quantum technology, as you must be aware, and being a student, you would have read much more than what I have read. Uh, uh, maintaining those conditions where, you know, quantum physics can actually happen, it's very difficult and we are still looking at, you know, uh, the technology where it can come down to operate at room temperature, so that's some distance away. Secondly, ad hoc network, uh, though uh, in swarm technology, yes, there's also a program which is going on in terms of, you know, having an ad hoc network when we uh, deploy the swarm drones. So, I mean, my uh, knowledge on that would be limited or know-how on that would be limited. Maybe just in case, sir would like to add something on the swarm drones and the ad hoc uh, networks. Sir. Ad hoc networks uh, is actually the basic building block of the airborne network part. Uh, we also call it MANET. Uh, so uh, that that is how it happens. Actually, the airborne network be becomes live. Uh, it's a kind of ad hoc network. So it is already implemented. And we are running applications on that. Okay. So we come to the end of uh, this session. Uh, I would uh, like you to uh, join me in giving a hand to the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, our esteemed speakers. Now I request Dr. Deves Watsar to come up on the stage to share the token of appreciation to all our esteemed panel members. Thank you for sharing your views. Thank you. Sir, please. Thank you, thank you everyone for having patience, thank you.